I'm Vijay Vaitiswaran, China Business and Finance Editor for The Economist and Chairman of the Ideas Economy Event Series. You're about to see one of the highlights from our 2013 Ideas Economy Innovation Forum Working Group Sessions. I hope you enjoy it. Tell us what you think at hashtag Ideas Economy. Just a very brief introduction to my panelists. So to my immediate left here, I have Jim Wales of Verizon. He's the executive director of the innovation program at Verizon. To Jim's left is Dave Evans of Cisco. He's the chief futurist for the company and the senior director and chief technologist of the Cisco Internet Business Solutions Group. To Dave's left is Paul Sappho, and he's currently the managing director of Foresight at Discern Analytics, and he also teaches at Stanford University, where he's a visiting scholar in the Stanford Media X Research Network. Why, why have we chosen to have this panel? Well, we think, you know, in terms of innovation, the thing to net, as I like to call it, this idea of an internet of things, shorthand thing to net. We've been talking, I've been writing about this for probably, it's here, it's here, I keep saying, for like five, seven, eight years, and it never quite makes it. But I think there are probably three things in 2013 that mean we are right on the cusp of this actually happening. Um, the first is the availability of internet IP addresses. And the second thing is the, the dramatic decline in the cost, with the availability of dramatic increase in the availability of storage, of, so you can store all kinds of, of data, and the dramatic f decline in the cost of doing so. And then I think the third thing that is, is going to be different is that there is a lot more bandwidth. So clearly, you know, the rollout of 4G, LTE, all this kind of stuff, the, the ability to get information shared dramatically fast over the internet is expanding. Uh, first of all, what I'm going to do is ask each panelist to speak about their own take on uh, the Internet of Things. And I'm going to start with, uh, with Dave. Would you like to kick off? Yeah, you bet. Thank you. So I'm going to cover three things just to kind of kick this off. So first of all, how do we get where we are? Um, what is it? What is IOE? What is this thing we're talking about? And then a little bit, where are we going? So first of all, how do we get where we are? Something really interesting happened in 2008, which was the number of things exceeded the number of people using the Internet. Today, there are about two and a half billion people using the internet. It took two decades for that to occur. It will take less than five years for the next billion to connect. So that's the pace that we're on. Um, and there are roughly around 10 billion things connected to the network today. So we've now got about four to five times as many things connected to the network as there are people. So we often think about the, the internet as a network for and by people. It's actually not. It's now a network of for and by things. It's about things communicating and sharing for the benefit of people. But it only starts getting interesting when these things start talking to one another, when they sense, when they share, and that's sort of the IOE um, definition. And IOE is about four things, a confluence of four things. It's about the things that we've talked about. It's about people, process, and data. And let me just touch on those four pillars for a moment. So people. We typically access the internet through some proxy device. It might be your laptop, your iPad, um, your phone. That's about to change pretty radically in the next few years where you will have on you, around you, even in you, a myriad of different devices that connect to the internet on your behalf. So uh, it could be the pill that you've swallowed that notifies your physician through your mobile phone that you've taken the pill that you need to take. It could be the quantified self devices that we all wear. It could be the Google Glass type devices or your glasses not connected to the internet for you. We may have dozens of things that connect to the internet on our behalf. So that's sort of the people side of it. The process side of it talks to um, the process to manage all these things and orchestration of these things. So as billions upon billions of things connect, we better make sure there's logic and orchestration and process for all of these things to work together. So there's the data element. Now data is, should be no surprise, is growing at exponential rates. Today we're generating about a zettabyte of information annually. By the end of this year, we will generate more new information every 10 minutes than humans did in all of human history as of 2008. That's a lot of data. I mean, we call it big data, maybe we should call it humongous data. And then things which are pretty, um, uh, self-explanatory. But the one thing I will say about things is things are going to get really, really smart very, very soon. And let me explain 
uh, what I mean by that. And this is sort of the where we're going element of it. It's no surprise that more and more things are moving to the cloud. And it means that when you have a device that has a connection, you now can tap into the power that is the cloud. You no longer hold a phone in your hand, you hold a supercomputer in your hand because you can connect to the cloud through a connection. So what can you do? Very soon you'll be able to do things like language translation. You have a phone conversation with someone, you speak the language of your choice, they'll hear it in the language of your choice. There are services already today that do face recognition, emotion recognition, um, sex recognition, are you male, are you female, things like that. Object recognition, companies like Dextro Robotics, cloud services, you can pay a fraction of a penny to do object recognition. The point being to all of these services is that if your device simply has a connection, it means that that device can tap into that power. Today, less than 1% of the things that could be connected or benefit uh, from being connected are connected. Said another way, more than 99% of the world is not yet connected. There is a potential for 1.5 trillion things on our planet today, if we don't manufacture another thing, to be connected. That's 200 things per person. So although we think that this, we're well in, into this journey, we have just scratched the surface in terms of opportunity. Jim, so all these devices are going to be connected. Someone's got to help them talk to each other. That's what you do, right? How do, how do you see the Internet of Things evolving? A lot of what Dave talked about is what I'm doing every day. So if you want to, you want to connect a robot, something that you see on our commercials, you want to do that, that's what my team does. If you want to have a firefighter, you want to put a, put a, a headset on and you want to see something far away or you want to communicate, you can communicate back through LTE. So we're, we're bringing partners on every day. In fact, uh, we can hardly keep up with the numbers of, of partners that want to do this type of work. Spent a lot of time with uh, Verizon, someone I think year 17 or something like that. So I remember when uh, we had analog phones and they were large kind of clunky objects. And I remember when we first started, and I think we called it like short message service or something like that. And I thought that was kind of neat. And I remember sending my friend a message, which was like sitting right beside me. And he said, hey, man, what are you doing? Call me. Talk to me. And today, that same friend would, you know, he texts me yeah. Yeah, from, from Cincinnati. So anyway, that, that's like one of those transformations that I've seen happen. And then I'm sure there's some questions you all want to know, like what, what some of these devices are or what we're doing. And uh, looking forward to talking about it. Perfect. Thank you. Paul. I'll drop a couple of implications into all this and be very brief. First one is privacy. You know, how many people worry about their emails being read? You know, you don't have to raise your hand. I suspect it'd be everyone. I don't care what you write. If I really want to know about you, I want your behavior. Because what you write tells me what's in your head. And I'd rather know what's in your heart. And in a world of Internet of Things, just give me a six-month pattern of where your cell phone's been. Uh, or give me your car diagnostics. Tell me how often you break and how hard you break. That'll tell me more if I'm a Snoopy insurer and want to set your price. So it's a little bit like, you know, uh, 110 years ago, everybody predicted the horseless carriage. Nobody predicted uh, the traffic jam. The same thing is we're now performing a great unwitting experiment on ourselves with this world of increasingly ubiquitous things. And the good news is you won't have to worry about your email anymore. The bad news is that all of your things are going to be thinking on you all the time, to your doctor, to your insurer, to the government, to the large corporations, and, 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 and they'll be selling you things. But this is a world where things will be selling you things. Um, <laughs> except that you won't, and this is the second implication, I'll just stop, it's, you know, two that I think are kind of interesting from a longer list. Second one is in a world of internet things, you probably won't buy anything anymore. The moment you can track something, you can charge, charge for it. So has anyone ever thought it's kind of odd that we have to pay for water? Water is a free good. It's out in the world. But we don't pay for air. Well, I can promise you, when they can start labeling uh, oxygen molecules, we'll be paying for air. That's a long ways off. But in the meantime, what we're shifting away from is a world in which we actually buy products to a world in which we subscribe to products. And as we start putting addressability onto individual and ever smaller things, the companies will retain ownership and sell you a subscription. You don't buy books on Amazon. Uh, you subscribe to them, and they can cancel your subscription at any time and take their library back. 
uh, it's moving solidly into physical objects as well. They're, you know, the leading hearing aid company today doesn't sell its hearing aid anymore. It subscribes to it. So in a world where we can actually track things with deeper granularity, it's going to have a vast change to how we price things and what the relationship is between purchaser and customer. Thank you very much. There's lots of, lots of very interesting uh, material and areas we could, we could explore. I interviewed uh, Tony Fidel recently, who is the guy, used to, the guy who created the uh, iPod. And he has produced the Nest, which is a thinking, we call it a thinking thermostat, learning. so a learning thermostat. Yeah. Put it on your wall, and it basically monitors your behavior, if you so wish it to do, and then alters the temperature in your house according to your behavior. I asked him, I said, you know, Tony, how long do you think it will be before we all have these kinds of machines in our houses? And he said, well, you know, I think it's about five to 10 years. And he said, there are three things that need to happen before that. Number one, as of yet, there is no real agreement around standards for devices to talk to one another. And somehow we need to get to an agreement across this whole internet of things, number one. Number two, he said, I think we also need socialization. And I said, what I mean by that is people need to get used to their devices taking decisions for them. So, you know, we're, we're at a point where we're happy to let our, our phone sort of complete sentences for us when we start typing. That's okay. He said, but I still think that we're still a ways away from this sort of comfort with the predictive and then action following the predictiveness. And then the third thing he said is I, I also think that there are some issues still with around data storage, data uh, availability, you know, just the, the, the bandwidth. You know, we're still not quite there yet, but it's coming. Can we just talk a little bit about the... the the sort of technological um, hurdles that still need to be overcome. You know, I, I think to clarify, at certain levels of the stack, they talk together just fine. Um, there are standards like Zigbee and Z-Wave and so on. Where it starts to break down is more at the application level, so that your thermostat can talk to your car, can talk to your TV, can talk to your media player, can talk to you. We're not quite there yet, universally, but lower levels of the stack where most of the foundational work is being done, that's pretty solid. Yeah, I agree with Dave. I think some of the technical challenges that we haven't quite hit yet are when you have a billion or a trillion of anything, you start talking about big, big stuff, you start using a lot of power. A lot of us come from a telephony background or a, a background that doesn't talk about these big things like these big ships or these bigger power or other things. So sometimes it's in the innovation program, it's good to hire people and, and good to like reach out to folks who know other parts like power, like energy harvesting, like power scavenging. That's some of the stuff that we really, we're not there yet. We, we still need to keep focusing on that. We still need to do some research around that. Got it. I'm actually a huge optimist about all this, but for some reason I'm giving the <laughs> like bummer examples today. You know, we always automate the wrong things first. You know, we invented the telephone and then it took us 80 years to invent the answering machine. And we will do the same thing with the Internet of Things. And the, the biggest missing piece, in my opinion, is that when we have things that are deeply connected and have degrees of autonomy, we need the interface design to make the things account for themselves and to also know when they're operating outside their envelope of authority. And we had a, a very dramatic example of that with Air France Flight 447, which crashed in mid-Atlantic. Mm -hmm. At two, two hours GMT, uh, the pilot reported a little bit of turbulence. At 2.10, the autopilot switched off and said, invalid information, it turned out. And it was a software problem intersecting with a mechanical problem. The pilots figured out what was wrong. They figured it out 15 seconds too late, and everybody died. And that was a case when the thing didn't explain to the human the information they needed. That, to me, is the big frontier here is making sure we have the interface designed right and the envelopes of authority designed right, or uh, we'll have some real problems. It's called quantified self. I, th I think what happens is it comes up from hackers and then filters into hospitals. So my guess is that doctors will be sneaking the devices into their practice in the same way in the 1980s people snuck personal computers and spreadsheets into their offices. It doesn't do anything for the really sophisticated stuff, but it, it, I think it'll change outcomes. Another big trend is that your mobile phone is rapidly becoming your first level diagnostic tool. 
We're seeing iPhone cases that do EKG scans, if you will, uh, microscopes, uh, blood samples. So we're seeing more of these types of connected devices penetrate healthcare. We have a long way to go, but we're seeing it already, things like that to make our lives easier. I mean, take for example, um, a GPS that does automatic traffic rerouting because the traffic's busy. Where does it get that information about the traffic from? It gets it from people's mobile <coughs> devices that send it back, maybe to Google, and uh, then tells you in your GPS, in your car, that you want to take an alternate route. We're getting better at that, but let's understand that Silicon Valley is one of only two high growth industries on the planet that refers to its customers as users. <laughs> the other one's based in Colombia, and, and I, would actually, I would actually argue they're better than Silicon Valley because A, their product actually works as advertised, and B, the first hit's free. Uh, and, you know, being so. serious for a moment, we're still bridging that gap. And I think part of it is, at the point of purchase, we buy options. Think of that super adjustable office chair you have in your, your office uh, that has all the up and down features. And after the first time you adjusted it, how many times did you adjust it afterwards? So all the things that cause you to want to buy something get in the way of being doing simple ease of use. And I, I think the big frontier is, is confecting software that allows devices to simplify in the right way. Privacy is a difficult one, and we need to be careful not to give away privacy for convenience. There's times when giving away privacy is perfectly fine. For example, uh, the GPS example I gave earlier, it will willingly give away our location, maybe in an anonymous fashion, um, because it benefits us. So I think done right, it can be mm. valuable, mm. but it should not be abused. I, I think it's finding that benefit to yeah. that, That's right. yeah, benefit to value. Striking really, that benefit. Yeah. Finding that balance is key. Americans profess to talk about <coughs> privacy or care about it, but the moment you offer them the, the cheapest free trinket or the slightest little compensation, they will absolutely <laughs> spill their guts. Uh, and, and, and it's going to take a major privacy crisis before that, before that changes.